Hi, I'm Tracy with Spilling the Tea, and I'm so excited to have Dr. Joseph Michelli with me today. Oh, he's been such an incredible mentor in my life. He's a New York Times bestselling author. He is the CEO of the Michelli Experience, and you are in for a treat. Hi, Joseph. It's great to see you. I'm super excited to have you here. Um, when you said that you were willing to come, I, I, I messaged you back and was like, can you see me jumping up and down? And it sounds kind of funny, but I literally was jumping up and down having you on here. It's like a dream come true. Well, anybody who knows you can really imagine that. It's like <laughs> fully, completely imaginable. We have such enthusiasm, excitement, and energy. So uh, yeah, I can visualize it. So, um, yeah, so it's true. I was, I was jumping up and down. So thank you so much for being here. And I know I, one of the things that I love about spilling the tea and this podcast is that it's completely unscripted and nobody knows where we're going to go. Not even me. Right. But I, I really wanted to just start and go back to when I very first saw you because it was a super powerful moment for me. And you were the keynote speaker and I believe we were in Long Beach, California. And that was years and years ago. And it takes a lot to captivate me, which I mean, I, I love to listen to motivational speakers and I love to um, read motivational books, but to actually captivate my heart and to keep me like this the entire time, the only person that's ever done that in my entire life is you. At least the only person who you're talking to right now that's ever done that. <laughs> well, maybe there'll be someone else that comes along that does that. But, but it was it was a moment that I will never forget. And um, you were the, one of the things that really spoke to me is you talked about Nora. Yeah, well, Nora's uh, my bride. She uh, she dated me for a year, fifty one weeks longer than any other woman had ever dated me before, and. Uh, she was really a hard sell uh, in the sense that it required us to have a conversation about something bigger than ourselves and to really envision what our future could be together. And uh, I was so, so masculine. I had masculine toxicity about me when it came to that. I just like, look, I don't really want to talk about the future. I don't want to share my feelings about what I think. And and she was a hard uh, taskmaster. If I was going to get over that final hurdle, I needed to be willing to do that. And, and uh, it was so meaningful because my journey with her was one where we had a couple of kids. We created a legacy centered around uh, those kids being functional adults who gave more to the world than they took away. And then, and then, of course, every one of those love stories has some challenge, right? And for us, it was the ending when her breast cancer metastasized and how my kids showed up. Uh, in that most incredible time and her willingness to settle me down, to look beyond myself, to look beyond her, to look to us uh, is really what enabled a, a legacy for her that I'm very proud of in my children, who I just saw very recently. So uh, uh, they're, they're still OK. She did good by getting us to them. She did do great. And I, I just love that so much. I recently had a scare with breast cancer. And um, I lost my mom to breast cancer, which is probably one of the reasons why when I heard your story, I was like, wow, you know, just the legacy that she leaves. It just really reminded me of how important um, those connections are and how it doesn't matter when we're gone. We have the ability to leave a legacy just like Nora. Yeah. And, you know, I like I think cancer is this humbling phenomenon. Bre you know, Nora struggled with breast cancer for six years. Uh, you know, we went into remissions and we had you know, returns and, you know, triple negative really was not a very opportune kind of cancer to try to treat. Uh, we had a great run through that six year time dealing with all the complexities of it, but really getting closer, talking about our fears, confessing our deepest, darkest secrets and sins, really getting close to one another to realize that she could be a beacon for how we could grow and heal, even in a time when physically she was on the decline. That speaks volumes to the person that she was. Yeah, yeah. And I was just one of those lucky dudes who got to ride along. So I was pretty honored oh, to have that, that. that little journey with, uh, yeah. And, you know, and then, and then I've been blessed uh, since then with just great opportunities to share Nora with the world. Well, it definitely had an impact on me. And then, you know, little old me was inspired by you. And for me, you were like, uh, I look I look up to you in so many ways, not, not just as a successful, 
human being, but just you're kind and you're generous and you took time for me, which, oh, I'm going to cry. Oh, let's just stop before you cry. Let's stop because this is this is humility that is so really you, but it is so silly in a way. Look, you were one of those people who reached out after I presented and stayed in contact and kept talking about your own vision of where you wanted your life to go and very validating as you've been in this you know this time right now. But and you just kept talking about the passion you had to make the world a better place and and you've demonstrated in you know in your professional life in nursing and you demonstrated in your professional life in leadership and but you were still finding an ache for something bigger and different and you know it's pretty hard for most human beings to resist that kind of energy uh, because there are so many people and I'll be really candid I get a lot of people who reach out after a presentation most of whom you know they're just kind of nice but there's no vision there's no passion there's a lot of self-interest that drives them. And so you kind of have to be a little discerning about where you invest your energy. But it was really obvious that you were one of those people that was going to do great things, who had a bigger purpose. And so how can someone not? (laughs) So when you first, because you had the same, one of the things that you told me that I'll never forget was that, you know, Tracy, when you have a calling on your life like this, you're doing a disservice to the world if you don't go follow that. And so along the way, like I've had doubts, I've had discouragement, I've had failure, I've had, um, you know, roadblocks, like it has not been easy. And I hear that in the back of my mind, though, it's like, but if this is your calling, you have an obligation to the world, not just yourself, but to the world to go out and, and to speak and to reach hearts. And that was the thing that you did for me is you you reached my heart that day. And then I recognized through your encouragement that I had the ability to do the same. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, th- there is a lot of risk that goes on betting on yourself, right? There is. And you got to use every mechanism to try to help people go through that risk. Now, if you didn't have the talent, I think it would have been really wrong for me to say to you, like, take the risk, Tracy, you know, (laughs) don't play it safe. You're going to go launch yourself into the great abyss. But you had the talent and and I think you knew it was there. You didn't want to honor it fully. I mean, we all have these voices in our heads that say, who are you? Who do you think you are? What you know, how are you going to make a difference? And uh, the world's filled with people who are like you and you know, why are you so special? But but you were and and look at how you found it. Like you really navigated. You didn't go all in really quickly. You you kind of slow rolled it. But you were always doing what we talked about, which is confluence, right? Like kind of bring your talents together in a slipstream that's taking you toward a goal. Be careful about doing lots of things over here and lots of things over there that you can't wed together toward your success. And I love where you've ended. It's so nurturing. It's so organically you. And I couldn't be more excited to be a part of this today, watching you where you are and what you're doing through this calling, uh, specifically Express the Rest Routine. Oh, thank you. It just to hear that come out of you, to hear you say that, it means a lot to me. Um, okay, so one of the things that we talked about was you, you didn't start out as a speaker, but you also had the same, I think you probably went through the same, because I remember when I came up with Tracy Ann Speaks and you got kind of tickled and you were like, I think you told me that yours was uh, Joseph Speaks. <laughs> yeah, it was Joseph Presents. That was my website, Joseph Presents. Joseph Presents. So uh, yeah, and, and it was a journey. Um, it's kind of interesting because there's a, a, a lady called Sarah Michelle who hired me uh, to speak one time. Now, I've been speaking as part of being a psychologist and an organizational consultant for a long time. And I worked in a hospital system. I had the regular day jobs, the nine to five with the 401k and the, you know all the other perks and benefits, uh, health benefits, for example. Um, and I kept doing these speeches and I do a hundred dollars and get a lunch, right? Like that's the kind of the way my speech career was going for a long, long time. And I always thought it was nice to have a little supplemental money from the speech, but this lady, um, said, well, how much do you charge to speak? And I said, well, you normally, uh, well, I said, I, this time for once, I didn't just say a hundred dollars, right? I said, well, I, I normally try to work within the budget of my client thinking she's going to say a hundred dollars. She goes, well, would a thousand dollars, uh, oh. for the speech be okay? I'm like, let me, you want 10 speeches? I mean, what are you talking about for a thousand dollars? And, uh, 
And after I did it, she goes, Joseph, I can't believe you just did this for a thousand dollars. Do you realize there's a whole industry of speakers out here? And, and you're, that's like table scraps for, you know, real professional speakers. I'm like, Oh my gosh. So anyway, she really encouraged me and said to me, Joseph, you know, you can do this, you know? So, but I wasn't willing to go all in either all at once. Right. I didn't want to give up the, the health benefits and kids and, um, so it really did take nurturing and it was that tipping point where you kind of say, all right, I've achieved success on this side. Um, I'm achieving a significant amount of success in my speaking career. It's time to just go over the other side and kind of take it on. And it became my full-time business for a long time, along with consulting. And now I write books, consult and speak. So, okay. So I did love that. I love that because I don't know that you ever told me the story about what was the lady's name? Sarah Michelle. I mean, so you are my Sarah Michelle, right? So, and we all, I, all it takes is for one person to believe in us, one, to make a difference in our lives. And it might be and, a different person at different times in your life, right? Like you mm -hmm. different, different mentors, same path. Um, Sarah Michelle was certainly that one person who got me over the hump to, to be in this business. What about with, with your writing? Did you ever, did you ever look for someone to mentor you? Wow, this is so, this is really getting into the, just talk about spilling the tea, girl. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, so writing, it's it's ironic to me that I am a writer uh, at all. I, I'm the oral presenter. I definitely get the idea of sharing the spoken word, right? But the written word is so daunting. I mean, I always thought of writers like Thoreau and they got up in the morning and they had to write and they, they, you know, if they hadn't written enough in a day, they weren't fulfilled. For me, writing was, you know, if I couldn't talk to you, then I would write. Um, so it was a really hard journey, but it wasn't so much a teacher that did it. It was I wanted to share a story of another human being uh, because there had already been a book and it was about the Pike Place Fish Market. And the book was called Fish. And the book told a story that, you know, if you wanted to be successful in the smelly little fish market, you needed to you needed to be able to focus on making their day, choose your attitude, play. There was these these dimensions. Right. And the owner of the fish market who I'd worked with uh, and who I loved dearly, a great man by the name of Johnny Yokoyama said, you know, Joseph, the only thing I mean, we're getting great success from this, it's an amazing book, people love it, but it's really not the source material of what makes us great. I mean, fun or play is a byproduct. It's not what we do to try to create greatness. And uh, I said, well, then let's do a book about it. And uh, he said, well, I'd love to, but can you write? And so he had his attorney and he had his colleague and he had all these people. And they said, we're going to send you over to this place and you're going to just write something for the next hour and a half and bring it back to us. And if we think it's good enough, we'll let you co-author a book with Johnny. And I sat at the Pike Place Market in Seattle, some little bar and was writing away and brought that back to them. And they said, yeah, we'll, we'll let you co-author a book with Johnny. And uh, that was really my breakthrough into writing business books. And yeah, it's been so easy ever since to to just step into that role of, I'm just going to tell a story about somebody else's greatness. And it works out wonderfully for me as well. Well, you know what I love about that is that that's the whole reason why I started Esther Tea, because each of our blends of tea are named after ordinary women living an extraordinary life. And I'm and loving telling their stories. And I think it's exactly what you said. I think you can do anything in life when your heart is in it, right? And when you, when you're, when so writing for me is so I, I'm not as confident yet in my writing as I am my speaking because it's easy for me to have a conversation because I genuinely care about humans. It's I'm not as confident in my writing because I'm my worst critic, right? So like when I, but I, you gave me some advice one time and you said you don't start at the beginning and you don't go to the end. You just write. You just sit down and write. And you just start. And that's what I've done. Like when I write, that's exactly the reason I write is exactly what you said, is that when I can't have a conversation and I want to tell something, I have to have an outlet to get it out. And so I'll sit down and write it. And that is, it's almost like therapy for me, to be honest. Yeah. And then there are people who are auditory learners who want to hear stories orally. Other people like the quiet of their time to savor a story as they read it. Uh, so I think, you know, it's just learning the art of writing. And 
frankly, I think the point you were trying to make earlier is one that, that I agree with, which is when I'm speaking, I can't go back and just undo that last sentence. Whatever I just said, it's gone. And I crafted it well enough to be okay with it, but I'm really more concerned about my next sentence, uh, that it doesn't sound as stupid as the last one. Um, <laughs> But when I'm writing, I can see it and I can go back and I can change that last sentence and I can become if I'm in my critic, we all have our critic. Right. But if I'm in my critic while I'm writing, I can't do anything. I just am paralyzed by my critic. So I try to at least say, hey, critic, you have a really important role in my life. Um, I'm glad that you're there. I'd have no self-awareness if I didn't have you. So, um, you know, but please, for now, let me just write and I promise I'll honor your space. You know, you'll have a chance to come back in and make sure that I don't sound like a goofball. But don't get in my way right now. I need to communicate. I need to get this out. This person I'm writing about, the, the people in Esther T that you write about and that are associated with your brands, they deserve, just like you deserve to not you know, let the world deserve to not let you deny your talent. The people that we tell stories about deserve to have their stories told without the critics stopping them. You know, mm -hmm. so just keep writing. And, you know, the critic will have their chance to make it better. That is such amazing advice. And as I'm sitting here, I'm convicted by the fact that I need to get back to writing because I, I, I don't write as much anymore because of the critic. And so, and I, th I think really in life, we all have that critic inside us that says, you know, like, like for one, one thing that I wait, one reason I waited to do all this, like I had a million reasons why, right? Like, well, I need to lose weight. Well, I need to do this. Well, I need to have success. I mean, I had all these reasons why it took me so long to get here. You've heard them all, right? I've made probably every excuse there is. And the truth is that I finally just realized that my purpose and my life was never about me. It's about, it's about, it's about what can I give to the world? And, um, oh, why am I so emotional? I have this, I I'm always here just to rescue from your emotion, even though I love emotion and I could let you just, you know, just become a puddle of emotion. Um, <laughs> For me, you know, I, I think I live in a motto that service serves us, right? So if we extend ourselves in the service of others, it serves us. Uh, yes. And I don't have to think about the me in this thing because it's going gonna, it's gonna to work out. I really believe in the law of reciprocity, not always one for one. Like what I give, I don't always get back exactly equal. And sometimes I get five times more than I gave and it's phenomenal. Other times I give something and this like crickets, I don't hear anything. And, and if you keep score, you probably don't do real well, but if you balance it out, you play with a long checking account, like a deep checking account, you kind of don't you know, correct it every night. Um, it works out and it has worked out for me. I can't believe the success I've had. I know what success you're having and what you're going to have. Um, so that giving thing is is the key. And, and writing is a hard way to give. It's just a harder way to give than spending your time with somebody or affirming somebody. But we need to keep a record of the greatness of the world. And we need to push it out because the world has got so much, you know, cynicism and skepticism and you know, just split and a lack of civil discourse. So let's just share some positive stories because people are hungry. It's so true. And I, people always ask me, you know, where does the joy come from, Tracy? Because you've had some bad things happen in your life. And I, it's, you know, for me, the joy is different. Joy is different than happiness. Happiness is something that I think too many of us are, are seeking. But for me, the joy, I mean, the happiness is going, it's fleeting. It's going to come and go and come and go and come and go. And I don't think we were ever meant to be happy all the time. But joy is something, to me, it's like living from the inside out. And that is a constant for me. So it doesn't matter. It's not circumstantial. It doesn't matter what's happening around me. I still have a joyful soul. Yeah. And, um, yeah you are the quintessential font of joy. Um, the truth is you've had some pretty unhappy times. <laughs> uh, and I mean, I've had unhappy times, but nothing on par with you. I just look at you and I go, but for the grace of God, go I, right? Um, and you have never wavered in your joy, uh, even in the deepest pits of unhappiness. And so thank you for that. And I, the joy comes out in the product, right? This product is a joy-oriented product. It's a font of joy that you're spilling out into the world, just like we're spilling the tea in this podcast. <laughs> Wasn't that a cute name, spilling the I tea? I love spilling the tea. <laughs> uh. 
Yeah, I was just on a call this morning with a group from England. They'd probably really love to spill the tea. They would love to spill the tea. <laughs> oh, I just love it. Okay, so um, tell me, are you writing right now? Do you have? Oh, a, I am. You... I am. I am. You know, I'm working on a project for a, a company out of Australia. Which again is, how does this little kid from Florence, Colorado? You know, it, we have a population of of 3000 people. They brought the federal prison in and that doubled our population. So we now have, you know, 6000 people and uh, half of our population is federal prisoners. So uh, I come from this tiny little town. My dad, my dad graduated from high school, just barely my mom graduated from eighth grade, you know, here I am in the place where I'm consulting and writing books about a company out of, out of uh, Australia. And it's, uh, it's a telecom that has the world's greatest customer experience from a telecommunications company. Can you imagine your telephone company uh, being ranked as just extraordinary in human experiences? So, yeah, so I'm working on that book. It'll be out next year. Um, it'll be published by, uh, by an Australian publisher. So it's a little different. But I wrote a book about a Singaporean company a few years back and just weaved it into my otherwise portfolio of McGraw-Hill published books about Starbucks and Zappos and Mercedes-Benz and Ritz-Carlton and all those kinds of brands. Why customer, why the customer experience? What, what, <laughs> you probably get this question all the time. <laughs> yeah, why? Why did it? I have no <laughs> idea. Uh, you know, for me, it is just the, it's, let's just talk about human service. Like it, we are on this earth to make the lives of other people better, right? So brands that get that fundamentally they then think about how do we create the best products? How do we create the best service? How do we wrap those products and services, envelop them in an in a emotionally wonderful context for our customers so that they will want to keep coming back and tell their friends? And so that's the business I'm in. I'm in the business of saying to leaders, like whispering in their ear, look, it's not about you. Just like Tracy said, it's not about you. Um, it's about your people and it's about your customers. And the more you focus on those things, the easier strategy is to define and the easier it is for you to use the voice of the customer to design the experiences you want to create. So for me, that's been my entire journey. I mean, you could say it's a spiritual journey in a secular realm, right? Like I tend to believe we're placed on the earth to make the lives of others better. So my job is to help business leaders execute strategies that make the lives of the people they serve internally and externally better through the experiences they create. And you do that with excellence. We talked about that earlier before we went live about, let's talk about that for a minute because that was such a fun conversation about perfection because I think in a world where where, where most people, sometimes you look at um, just what you see on TV or what you see on Instagram, even when we're like posting our own pictures and we, we filter them. And I've done that before, like, I mean, we want to look good and feel good about ourselves, right? Um, what I, what I, I'm at a stage in life where... It's no longer about perfection. Like these guys will tell you that I don't worry about what I look like anymore. I don't worry about, you know, if I gained five pounds over Thanksgiving, which I did, by the way. <laughs> well, it meant, it meant you were eating well. That's good. I'm glad. <laughs> right? I did. I ate really well. I cooked and ate well. But the truth is that if, if we make it about us, then we're never going to be satisfied, right? And there is, I don't think there's any such thing as perfection, but I do love our conversation because I do live my life with the principle of striving for more and raising the bar. Yeah. So first off, I, I just, I retweeted something the other day and it, it was, it implied the following, right? Like social media is the highlight reel of people's lives. And yet we live kind of in the knowing of our true self. Uh, so we're kind of creating this emotional chasm between what we want the world to see, uh, polished and filtered and, you know, the best of our life uh, versus what we really know about ourselves. And that that chasm can be really, I think, emotionally depressing for a lot of people. Um, and it also just creates an expectation of something that's unattainable. But to the point of excellence and perfection, you know, when we were talking before, I was just highlighting another one of those people who've had an incredible effect on my life. And his name is Horst Schulte, and he's the founder of the modern day Ritz-Carlton Hotel Company. And he and I, he mentored me. Yeah, you know, I, I approached him. And I said, will you be my mentor? Um, and he was so kind. And it, he put a lot of hurdles between me and getting his mentorship. He didn't make it easy. He kind of wanted to see how committed was I to pursue what I asked for, like it would just be dropped onto me. Um, and, I, and I got through those hurdles authentically out of my passion for really wanting to be a great servant leader. And 
but what he would do, he battled me at times, uh, you know, which I loved about him. He would say things like, Joseph, um, I think you should be striving for perfection. And I would say, of course, I'm a psychologist. I know that, you know, the seeking of perfection can be disillusioning. It can be demotivating. You know, it's unattainable. I want to be realistic, of course. And he would say, hmm, how boring, you know, how absolutely boring. But if if you're going to go there, then uh, let me just try to understand what would you aspire to? And I would say something like excellence. And he would say, all right, well, excellent. So if you don't make it, because that's probably not attainable, you probably settle for mediocrity. And I would say, of course, that's so cool. He goes, by the way, what percentage would be good enough for you? I'd say like 90%. And he would say, well, what if in a customer service sense, that 10% was your mom, your cousin, your aunt, your niece, that's okay then, right? And he just had these ways of saying, we get it, Joseph, you can't be perfect. Like we get it, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't be aspiring. And if you ever stop and you get 90%, you go, woohoo, we get the prize, you're a dunce. Right? You're just going to slide back into mediocrity. So I love the tension between excellence and perfection. And I think we should always be aspiring for perfection, knowing that if we can get one step closer today than we were yesterday, we're making progress. I love that too, because I live my life that way where, okay, so t today's over in, in some days, some days are not good, right? Some mo sometimes it's just moments, sometimes it's days. But when I wake up in the morning, the guys were asking me about this earlier. I was like, well, for me, the difference in mindset, in my mindset is before my feet hit the ground in the morning, I start running in my head through all the things that I'm gratitude, all the things that I'm grateful for. And when, and I've trained my mind and I've tried to teach people this and I'll tell, they're, they're like, how do you, how do you have so much joy? I was like, well, it starts with gratitude, right? You just have to be grateful. And when you have a grateful, a truly grateful heart and your mindset is right, then it's much easier to keep attaining that and raising the bar and raising the bar and raising the bar. And then for me, it's like when you fail, when I fail, it's not like detrimental. It's like, all right, you failed. You, you know, you, you, you learn from that. Try, fail, learn, try, fail, learn. And eventually you try and you get it and you succeed, right? And so for me, it's been a lot of failing, a whole lot of failing, right? And so, so many times I should have in the modern day world quit, but it's just not in me. Yeah, and I think there's a failing forward, right? And then there's yes. just a failing. <laughs> and I think the art of failing is to fail forward, right? Like, okay, I failed at that. Now, how do I propel myself through that failure to something ahead of me? Uh, as how to, as opposed to how do I retreat in the context of failure? So mm -hmm. I love the way you're framing failure. And, and you know, I have written a book for parents uh, called Humor, Play and Laughter, Stress Proofing Life with Your Kids, which is the biggest lie of any tagline ever. Like you could stress proof life with your kids. But the what I, what I wrote in there early on when my kids were little, it was a joy journal and really keeping a joy journal, not just a you know, a, a gratitude journal, but a true joy journal, anything that brings you joy. And I screwed up a lot as a parent. And I'll tell you one of the big screw ups so that this doesn't make it sound like I'm some hero or something. But, you know, there'd be days when my kids were adolescents and I would come home and they would be in their rooms and and I would be perfectly OK to not go in there because I knew that if I go in there, it's like, yeah, gee, and when you, you know, they were so into their thing. I didn't want to deal with the tension. What a mistake. Today, I regret every day that I did not go into their room. You know, sometimes I, I just wish that I had gone in there and sat next to them and listened to whatever initial, you know, angst they might have had about me being in their space so that I didn't miss those moments because I do miss them now. But, but one thing I did write as a parent was if, when my kids were really, really little, I would sit next to them uh, at night after reading a book and I would say to them before you go to sleep the one thing I want in your brain before you go to sleep is the thing that brought you joy today tell me mm -hmm. something that brought you joy today and they would do their thing and I would tell them something that brought me joy almost always about them right always something that they did just the smallest things that brought joy and it was so it was as much for me as for them but I wanted them to be joy spotters in the world right I wanted uh -huh. them to be the people who weren't just swallowed up by the negativity of the world. Um, so it, your joy thing really kind of triggered that remembrance of laying with my kids and asking what one thing brought you joy today. And they knew they had to spot it, right? Like the next day they had to look for something because they were going to be called out at night. I love that. So anybody who knows me knows that my most favorite word is joy. 
And I, I think I think that it is a choice in a lot of ways, just like what you said. So when you train your mind to say, okay, dad's gonna ask me what it, what was joyful today, then you start thinking and seeing the world from a different lens. Yeah. You know, you start seeing joy and seeking joy and you start to be joy, right? Yeah, and you surround yourself with people who are about joy, right? So when they come up to you after a presentation uh, and they are exuding joy, you say, aha, uh -huh, that's one of those people that you want to be a part of. You want to be, you want to bring, you want to enter their world because they're going to make your world better. Oh, I love that. Do you think that there are certain people in our lives that, so I think, so I always talk about like the circle of five when I was leading my team, I would tell them, okay, you are the average of the five closest people to you. And so it's important that you pick your circle wisely. Because, and, and sometimes you'll have people in that circle where you're the giver. And sometimes you'll have people, this is my interpretation of Tracy. This is Tracy 101. Sometimes you'll have people in your circle where they're giving to you or they're, they're, they're putting in something into your life to make you a better human or to make you think differently. And sometimes that circle changes. And I do think that, don't you think that it's powerful to pick wisely? Yeah. You know, it's, I first say that, God gives us family so that we can get along with people we would otherwise not choose to be around, right? I mean, th th there's some of that in family. Sometimes we have people in our lives that are our family members that we wouldn't pick to be the closest inner circle. And we have to learn to get along with them. And sometimes we even have to distance ourselves from them if they're destructive, right? That's a part of it. But for the most part, we want to learn how to navigate the world of different people than what we would pull into our world. We're going to encounter those in the workforce too. We're going to encounter the all of those people we would not otherwise choose to associate with just because of the necessity of, of doing business. That said, when we're talking about that board of advisors of your life, right, that, that uh, executive team of your life, you want those people to be people that you look up to, that you respect, who hold values that are consistent with what you value, because if not, you're gonna be pulled down to the lowest common denominator in that circle. So I think it's important. And to your other point, it's not always about just receiving from people and it's not always about giving from people. Healthy relationships are an exchange of the gifts and talents of all those folks. And there are times it'll be a really dry spell where somebody will not have given to you for a long time and you start wondering, wow, is this really one of those people to keep in my inner circle or not? And it may even be worthy of having a conversation and a check-in right there to kind of point that out and see where, where we can make that twist again. But great relationships are one where we have an ebb and flow of great talents among people who are like-minded enough at a core level that they make us better, but dissimilar enough so that we're not just looking at ourselves, you know, five of ourselves around, because they're not going to make you better. The diversity within common and shared values and purpose, to me, that's what makes for greatness. Oh, I love that so much because I think that's a common problem with the world today is that, and I noticed this with my teams, like I, I liked having leaders of all different kinds because I found that if, you know, when we, when we surrounded ourselves, I think our human nature is to surround ourselves with people just like us. But when you really grow is when you surround yourself with people who aren't like you and they help you to think differently. They ask you those tough questions and they make you want to know and know more about life. I have friends like that. Dora is one of my friends like that, that a lot of times we don't see eye to eye on, on, on things, you know, where politics or religion or just life in general, but we can have the most spirited debates and love each other at the end. And I, I love that about her because she's helped me to really think differently. Throughout so, my years. you know, I mentioned Horst Schultz, a very rigid, formal, polished, old world service. He was a mentor of mine. I am so not any of that, right? But all of those things, there's truths to them that I need to hear, that I need to think about how mm -hmm. do I take pieces of that within my own, you know, vehicle here. And then I would go to the other extreme. I worked with Tony Shea, who was the founder of Zappos and who died in a really traumatic way and kind of just self disintegrated in his life. Um, but he was so loose and relaxed and introspective and incredible service minded person, but almost shy. Uh, so you've got, and I've had all these different kind of mentors, right? And and I know that I'm not either of those two people, but there's something great about both of them that have pulled on me to say, look, being a service oriented person doesn't always mean you're outgoing. 
sometimes you just be with people quietly, right? And, so and then Horace is like, you need to be very intentional. It can't just be, oh, whatever happens, man. You know. So anyway, it, there's greatness in all that. You know, and I think it's so interesting what you said because most people think that I'm an extrovert. And um, I'm really not, to be honest. Like it, it is, it, it's, it's tough for me to get up in front of people and speak. The difference is that I once got in front of, it was with great clips, and I got up on stage and, um, and I had, there was a leader, he was a VP at Great Clips, and he was like, you know, Tracy, can you come do this talk about this? And I, I told him, I was like, do I have to speak from a script this time? Because you're asking me to talk about core values. And when you ask me to speak about core values, that's from the heart for me. And so if I go up there and I just talk about scripted and you have me rehearse it and rehearse it and rehearse it, no one's going to listen because it's going to be boring because it's going to be what you want me to say. But if you'll just let me trust me this one time to get up there, especially because it's something I'm passionate about. If you'll just let me speak from the heart, I I think that that we could actually grab the attention and make a difference. And he said, just don't screw it up. <laughs> yeah, if so, I'm gonna give you this rope, please don't right. hang us both with it, right? Yeah. And um, there it ended up being a much larger audience than I thought. And I had this like panicked moment before I went out there because I was like, oh my gosh, I don't I have done? a script. What I don't have an done? outline. I don't know what I'm going to say, you know. And I spoke with this lady who um, was a retired middle school principal. And she said to me, and she was, she called like randomly. And I, I, I answered and I told her, I said, oh, I'm about to go out on stage and I don't know what I'm going to say. And she said, can you go someplace in the corner and get quiet? And I said, yes. And so she just talked with me and she said, you know how you love lighthouses? And I said, yes. And she said, you're a light, Tracy. And all you have to do is go out there and shine your light. And if one person finds their way, you, it will have been worth every minute. And it was in that moment that I went out there. I just felt this calmness after she said that. And every time I speak, I imagine the lighthouse. I imagine just being a light and shining the light. And I remember I got up there. I was nervous. I didn't want to be up there. But I knew in that moment because I watched it was almost like, you know how they do the wave? <laughs> At, at sports games, it was almost like a wave. And I felt like I was connecting one at a time. And I could almost see like lights, these like lights of people, like they were getting it. And I was just speaking from the heart. And I think that I know that authentic connections like that, we're missing that in today's world. Well, and that's because people are so concerned about the filters and everything, right? That, that that we can over manufacture a message that doesn't resonate. It's it's beautifully from the production qualities, it looks fabulous, but from a does it sustain me for very long? Not so much. Right. Every time I, you know, I I I'm also an introvert, just to be clear. I'm it's painful for me to be at a party with strangers that I don't know. Same. It's just really hard and I have to talk myself into being able to function in that environment. But I also have to talk to myself before I got on a, a stage because I know what I do on a stage. I have my slides. It's never scripted, but I at least have some kind of thing that keeps the flow going. So I kind of know what's going to come next. But I always have to say, this is not about really getting people to stand up at the end and go, Michelle, you rock. You're amazing. <laughs> right? Like it's it, it, the more I think about wanting that, the less I'm going to be present with this audience, mm -hmm. the more I'm going to be trying to manipulate them to jump up on their feet at the very end. Um, the more I say to myself, this is about you giving it all away, about thinking about who they are, what they need, and really hoping against hope that you bring the right intention to the right people at the right time. And if you do that, then people are going to jump up on their feet. They're going to swing from the chandeliers. It's going to be a fabulous experience and you will have been party to that journey. And so, and it works out that way. And and I do sometimes screw that up and forget to do that intention. It's always just like, ugh, you know. But you know what? You you did that for me. And before we go, because I don't want to take up too much of your time. I'm just so grateful. But before we go, and remind you of something that you've probably forgotten about. So um, when you were mentoring me, um, and we were talking about, you know, I was gathering my keynote speech um, and I still haven't gone there yet, but I'm going to. I'm on my way at this point. Well, my mentorship was, offer is not time expired. So anytime yeah. you want to have a conversation about it, let's do it. Awesome. 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 Okay. So I was talking to you about, you were really just digging into or helping me like really dig deep into who I was. And I was telling you a story about my mom and how, um, 
she, and I've used this, I've told a lot of people this story because you helped me. One of the things you said is you shouldn't speak about things that you haven't dealt with. And at that moment, until that moment, I hadn't really dealt with losing my mom. And um, I was telling you the story about it was Thanksgiving day and my mom was in hospice and um, I promised her that I would bring her home for Thanksgiving. It was her favorite holiday. And of course there was no one in the hospice whole hospice hospital except for maybe one or two nurses because everyone was home with their families and I said to my brother like we're taking mom home and he was like well how do you think we're gonna do that and I was like we're gonna load her in the car I promised her we were gonna be home we're going home today and so we took a bed sheet and it's a really sweet story crazy but sweet and my brother's like how are we gonna do that we're like looking down the hallway to (laughs) make sure no one saw us because we literally went without medical advice and um anyways we 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 carried her in a bed sheet and put her in the car and we took her home and with lots of challenges to get her to the car to get her to get her home in the car and also to get her back in the house and then we get there and she had been really lethargic and all of a sudden she says we had her in the wheelchair and we had her kind of strapped to the wheelchair and she says where's the turkey and um I was like thinking to myself, really? Like, I never fully felt um, like I met her, met, I met her expectations, you know, until you helped me really realize the message. This, there was this big message in this moment that was super important. And anyways, she was like, where's the turkey? And my mom's a gourmet cook. And I never felt like I could cook as well as her, even though I tried and tried and tried and tried. My job was always the dishes and setting the table. So anyways, I was like, thank goodness for Walmart. I ran to Walmart. I got a, all they had was a frozen turkey. I got a frozen turkey, the stuff to make her cornbread stuffing and a can of cranberry sauce. And my brother thought I was crazy. He's like, Tracy, I mean, it's a frozen turkey. I was like, so she can't eat it anyways. Like we're, we're going to maybe it's the smells like yeah, I don't know what it is so I made her cornbread stuffing and I put the turkey in the oven giblets and all frozen frozen solid and um and she was just kind of sitting there smiling and I anyways I made the cornbread stuffing and she was sitting in the wheelchair and I sat it in her lap and she started like squishing it like this and she was like it needs more broth and I thought to myself here we go you know I didn't meet her expectations. My stuffing is not going to be like hers. It never will be. And so um, I added more broth and she stuck her fingers back in there and she looked me right in the eyes and she said, it's perfect. And it was, it was, it, it was you that really helped me realize that that was her moment of letting me know that she was super proud of me. And I knew I did. I, I didn't know that till years later. But I, when I think back on, it, I think about it all the time now because she went to sleep after that and never woke up. Yeah, let's let's take it in a couple of different layers, right? Like first and foremost, the message is don't impose on an audience something you've not dealt with, because people are going to feel really uncomfortable if you're still struggling through it. Um, you know, unless you tell them I'm struggling through it. But even then, maybe you should do that in therapy, and you should use the audience with kind of a, a process you know, go through the emotion, but do it in a way that the audience comes away with something, right? Like hope, not just, you know, getting muddled in the middle because you haven't gotten through it. Um, So in that, now that you've processed it, right? Now the audience walks away from this by suggesting that it's never too late to keep improvising your way into the best relationship with human beings. It's never too late to, to keep fighting for a quality connection with another human being. It doesn't always turn out as wonderfully as your story, right? Sometimes uh, we try and the last moments of a life are ones where people still feel fractured, but we need to still invest ourselves in the possibility of healing relationships and finding that incredible acceptance that you looked for and you found. So what a blessed story it is. It's so great that you would process through it and now we're sharing it. And that's why you need to do more keynotes because people, (laughs) everybody needs to hear that story positioned. Can somebody in that audience going to feel that light coming from your lighthouse? It's really going to hit them hard on that day. And then they're going to come up to you and say, will you be my mentor? And then you'll, you'll be on the podcast on the other screen. That's the way it's going to work. So, right. (laughs) Well, Joseph, I want to take this time to just thank you from the bottom of my heart for believing in me when I didn't believe in myself and for 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 just pouring into me when you didn't have to. Like I was just a little peon and you took the time to make me feel special, but to also help me realize that um, you you inspired me years ago. You still inspire me today to walk in, our, in my purpose um, because you live your life that way. 
And I love the word I... pouring into because what a wonderful thing you're doing now. You're helping people pour into their cup, something that's nurturing for them. And let's keep pouring in to people and keep helping people pour to, to, to quench that thirst and create comfort. Let's do it. Can we do a virtual high five? I don't know if I can get your hand, but yeah, we're, we'll get in the same area. <laughs> Thank you so much for being with me today and spending the time with me. It was an honor. Thank you. That's a wrap on Spilling the Tea. Stay tuned for our next podcast.